Proverbs chapter 29 and uh, the verse is 25. The fear of man brings a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. The last five weeks we've studied Richard Baxter on witnessing. He showed us the duty of witnessing, how to witness, why to witness, and urged up our witness urged us to back up our witness with a holy life. I think we all agree about it. We ought to witness more than we do and more effectively also. But the question is, do we witness? At times we all do, of course. Christians almost can't help that. But are we eager to do it? And do we speak up for Christ with any regularity? Well, if we don't, why don't we? Well, you know why you don't. Because it's scary. If you do it, people will laugh at you or exclude you or not like you anymore. In extreme cases, people will even persecute you if you witness for Christ. And so we don't witness much because we fear man. Now, some fear is good. The Bible says there is a time to speak and a time to keep silent. Our Lord Jesus knew that some men will not listen. And so he told us to not cast our pearls before swine, lest they trample them underfoot, turn around, and tear into us. But caution, like other good things, may be overdone. In the name of prudence or wisdom, we mustn't become cowards. The fear of man is sinful, Baxter says, when it ascribes more to the creature than is its due. In other words, it's wrong to fear men when we fear them more than God, or when we'd rather disobey the Lord than offend an unbeliever. In some people, this fear is overwhelming. They'd rather do anything in the world than to speak up for Christ. In his commentary on Proverbs, Charles Bridges knew veteran soldiers who, quote, were bold to face danger but would shrink from shame. They fearlessly face the cannon's mouth, yet are panic-stricken at ridicule. Most of us, I hope, are not that far along, but you know, to be honest, even a little bit of fear goes a long way in suppressing our witness for Christ. What do we do about it? How do we face our fears and overcome them for Christ's sake? Well, Baxter has a whole lot to say on this topic. Some of it tonight we'll look at. The number one thing to do if you really want to overcome your fears and to speak up boldly for Christ is value heaven more than earth. If you want to overcome the fear of man, you've got to value heaven more than earth. Here's what Baxter says. Lay up your treasure in heaven. It is a base, worldly heart that makes you afraid of men. Are you afraid they will cast you into hell? Are you afraid they will turn God against you? Are you afraid they will hinder one of your prayers? Are you afraid they will keep God's Spirit out of you? Are you afraid they will rob you of your grace? No. It is the hurting of your flesh or the diminishing of your reputation that you fear. Now that's not very fun to read, but it's certainly true. The reason we fear men so much is that we value the things they can take away from us more than the things they can't touch. Why is rejection so painful? Because we want approval. If we didn't want it so badly, we wouldn't deny the Lord to have it. So what if sinners laugh at you? Why is their acceptance so all-fired important? It is nothing but worldliness or valuing the opinion and the acceptance of men that makes us so reluctant to speak up for Christ. Jesus Christ said, Put ye first the kingdom of heaven. And Paul said, set your mind on things above and 
holy Christians in every age have always valued heaven more than earth and the good of their souls than the comfort of their bodies. And so the fact is, the reason we're so afraid to speak up, offend people, or even be offended is that we value the things of earth more than the things of heaven. So we've got to reverse that if we're going to speak up boldly for Christ. The second thing is pretty basic. Baxter says that if you want to speak up boldly for Christ, you've got to believe in God. That seems to be an obvious one. But listen to what he said. Compare God to man and his wisdom against their folly, his love against their malice, his power against their weakness, his promises against their threats, And if you are still afraid of man, you must confess that in that measure you do not believe in God. Away with atheism, and then fear no man. Well, Baxter is not mincing words on this one. You're afraid of some man's argument, forgetting that you've got God's wisdom on your side. You're afraid of man's, uh, you're afraid of losing man's approval, forgetting that God approves of you. You think a man is more likely to carry out his threats than God is to keep his promises. The Bible commands us to magnify the Lord, not to make him smaller and weaker than a mere mortal. Daniel 11.32 says, The people who know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Knowing God and believing in him as he is will go a long way in overcoming the fear of man. And so we've got to really back up uh, our professed beliefs in God. Oh yes, we believe in God. We believe He's infinite, eternal, and unchangeable. We believe He's true and almighty and loving and so forth. And then we stand before a friend and we're afraid to witness to that person because we're afraid God won't be with us. We're afraid God's wisdom is not greater than man's. We're afraid God's promises are not more certain than that person's threats. We've simply got to believe in God. Then number three, we've got to remember what man is. Baxter says, Remember what man is that you are so afraid of. He is a worm, a dream, a shadow, a dry leaf or the chaff that is blown by the wind. And is this creature to be feared above God? We all know people who have irrational fears. A fear of worms, mosquito hawks, daddy long legs or lizards. I read of a man who was terrified of hair. The fears are real, but they're also foolish. Worms can't hurt you. Hair can't kill you. Daddy long legs are not poisonous. We all know these things, and yet they're pretty hard to explain to a person who's terrified of these things. Well, you know, in the long run, man can't hurt you either. They can make this life pretty bad, of course, but this life is not the only life. In fact, for the believer in Christ, it is but a shadow of the real life that awaits us in glory. The fear of man is not only sinful, it's stupid. Psalm 118, verse 6 says, The Lord is on my side, I will not fear. What can man do unto me? And the answer is, he can't do much. Jesus Christ foresaw the day when his disciples would stand before councils and would be put on trial for their lives. Some of them would be persecuted and others would be executed for Christ's sake. And our Lord Jesus said to his disciples that they are not to fear man who can destroy the body but cannot destroy the soul. But they're only to fear God who can destroy both body and soul in hell. Remember what it is you're so afraid of. It's just a man. It's just a woman. It's just a kid. And these creatures, these creatures are very weak indeed in comparison to God. And at their worst, can't do you very much harm. And then related to this, the number four thing is, remember that the worst men are under the control of God. Remember that men are chained and dependent on God and have no power but what he gives them, and can do nothing but by his permission. And if God will let it be done, you have his promise that it shall work for your good. This says, in short, 
that people cannot hurt you without God's permission. And with that permission, the Lord mixes in a blessing for you. This means the abuse others heap on you is not more than you can tolerate. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13 says, There is no temptation that has taken you that is com- but that which is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted above what you are able, but will with the temptation make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. No temptation is greater than you can bear. Though well, That's hard to believe, but it is true. God gives mixes in grace with those temptations that we will be able to bear them or escape them. It also means the suffering you bear will be good for you in time. Not pleasant, not fun, not enjoyable, but good for you in time. Romans 8.28 says, We know that all things work together for good to those who love God to those who are the called according to his purpose. People can do terrible things to you, but nothing your loving Heavenly Father doesn't allow them to do. And if he allows it, it can't be bad for us in the long run. Here the story of Job is worth remembering. Remember in the first chapter of Job, there's a council meeting in heaven Satan appears before God and lays down a challenge that there's not a holy man in the world who fears God for nothing. God accepts the challenge and mentions his servant Job. Satan wants to strike Job, but God gives him very clear guidelines exactly how far he can go and not an inch farther. Satan does everything within his malice under the lordship of God Job suffers terribly with the loss of his children, the liquidation of his wealth, the betrayal of his wife, the abuse of his friends, and of course his body covered with leprosy. Terrible, terrible things he suffered. And yet, you know, remember in the end, James says that in the end, he saw the Lord was very pitiful. Job experienced the pity of God, which more than made up for this suffering that he endured. And so God may well allow someone to mistreat you, to abuse you, to laugh at you, to exclude you, to persecute you, but God doesn't allow them to do anything but that which in the end will be good for you. Hard to believe, but the Bible does teach that, and believe it, we must. Then number five, remember that suffering isn't as bad as you think it is. C.S. Lewis wrote a very fine book called The Problem of Pain. And I think it's right on the first page of this book he says that he himself <laughs> he himself does not cope with pain very well. And I certainly agree with him on that one. Pain is not something I am very good about. But whether I'm good at it or not doesn't change the fact that suffering is not very uh, is not as bad as you think it is. Suffering is never pleasant. It's never fun. That's why it's called suffering. But these painful experiences are not as bad as you think they are. About them, Baxter has a lot to say, such as, if you suffer for doing well, remember that Christ commands you to rejoice exceedingly. Unless our Lord is a lunatic or enjoys to see his, enjoys seeing his people suffer, There must be something good in the suffering he commands us to celebrate. And Baxter tells us what it is. Suffering provides a great help to holiness. Suffering is the ordinary way to heaven. Remember how small and short our suffering will be compared to the long and glorious reward. Remember that martyrs have the most glorious crown. And remember that the disciple is not above his master. His every point is worth developing. He says, suffering provides a great help to holiness. Of course it does. It breaks pride and worldliness, increases our felt dependence on Christ, and makes us long for glory. Suffering is the ordinary way to heaven. That's certainly what the Bible teaches. All who live godly in Christ Jesus 
will suffer persecution. It is through much tribulation that we enter the kingdom of heaven. John Bunyan compared the believer's life to a pilgrimage, a long, hard, exhausting, and dangerous journey. Years later, the American uh, novelist Nathaniel Hawthorne saw that most Christians were doing little more than going to church on Sunday. He wrote a spoof or a parody of Bunyan's book called The Celestial Railroad, or How to Get to Heaven in Luxury and with No Effort. Of course, he was joking about that. There is no way to heaven without effort, without suffering. Baxter says, How small and short our suffering will be compared to the long and glorious reward. Romans 8.18 makes that point. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. That's easy for me to say, for I've suffered very little for Christ. But I didn't say it. It was Paul who said it. And no one but our Savior suffered as much as he did. Yet he called his sufferings a light affliction, which is but for, which are, which is but for a moment. How small and short our sufferings will be compared to the long and glorious reward. And then remember that martyrs have the most glorious crown. This speaks for itself. The worst a man can do is kill you. Yet for the believer, death is gain. And death for Christ's sake is a coronation. Jesus Christ said to his church, Be faithful unto death, and I'll give you the crown of life. And then remember that the disciple is not above his master. If your Savior, Jesus Christ, went to heaven by way of the cross, why should you expect to get there without suffering for his namesake? Isaac Watts has a great hymn. Must I be carried to the skies on flowery beds of ease, while others fought to win the prize and sailed through bloody seas? The implied answer is no, of course not. If Jesus Christ went to heaven by way of the cross, and if the early Christians all went to heaven after much tribulation, why do we expect to go to heaven without it? Are we greater than our Master? Did Jesus Christ make a shortcut for, for us, a shortcut to heaven for us? He went the long way so we could take the short way? The Bible surely doesn't teach that. It teaches us that the disciple is not above his master, and the master was called uh, was called uh, Beelzebub, and mistreated terribly, and his disciples ought to expect the same treatment from the world. Now, First John tells us that the world does not know us because it did not know him, and just as the world did not know and value Christ. So the world doesn't understand and value his people. Therefore the world persecutes, hates, despises, laughs at, ridicules, and excludes the disciples of Christ. So brothers and sisters, let's get it straight. Speaking up for Christ leads to suffering. In some places it leads to death. You know, in Saudi Arabia, it's against the law to, to uh, evangelize someone from the Muslim religion. And the penalty for that is death. And though it's not as severe in most other places, in many other places, there are criminal penalties involved with uh, witnessing for Christ. Well, we don't have that persecution here yet. We might someday, someday soon perhaps. But at the moment, the persecution, the suffering that we have to endure is, a comparatively, is comparatively minor. We have to endure exclusion. We have to endure ridicule. We have to endure being not liked, unpopularity. And these are painful things. They really are. And yet, suffer them we must if we want to be faithful to our Savior, Jesus Christ. And if we want to be good to the souls of those people who do laugh at us, and exclude us. The gospel should be delivered as sweetly as possible. We should not make the gospel more offensive than it is by our own obnoxious behavior, our own conceit, our own self-righteousness. These things are awful. 
But no matter how sweetly the delivered, the gospel remains a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Greeks. In other words, the gospel is going to do one of three things. It's going to save the person you witness to, or it's going to enrage him, or it's going to make him laugh. You can expect one of those three responses. And we ought to. And not to fear the displeasure of man. Suffering for Christ is not as bad as you think it is. In fact, it's a good thing. It's an honor or privilege. The disciples, shortly after Pentecost, were arrested by the Hebrew council and they were whipped. And these whippings were severe things. They were 39 stripes with a cat of nine tails. This was not like a spanking. This was a severe punishment. And they left that place rejoicing in that they were counted worthy to suffer for Christ's sake. They considered it a badge of honor to suffer for the Lord. And if you read church history up through, well, let's say 200 A.D. or thereabouts, Christians considered it a great privilege to die for Christ. Read the old books or the books on the old saints and you see that uh, that they didn't fear Caesar. They didn't fear the lions. They didn't fear the chopping block. But rather they went to these tortures and deaths thankful to the Lord that they were counted worthy to die for His name. And so let's get out there and witness and may God give us the courage and patience to see souls saved for Christ's sake. Amen. Let's pray please. Heavenly Father, we give thanks to you through the Lord Jesus Christ that uh, the gospel is true and that it's your power for salvation. Now, Lord, your word says that they will not call upon the one whom they have not believed, and they will not believe unless they have a preacher. And so, Lord, I pray that we will be that preacher, that we'll speak to our friends, to our neighbors, to people we meet. Lord, the world is full of unsaved people. We have candidates at every turn. I pray, Lord, that you'd give opportunities to speak, and then you'd give grace to speak, and then you'd actually save those we speak to. Keep us, Lord, from being so scared and so worried about hurting someone's feelings or so worried about uh, being disliked as a result of our Christian witness. I pray, Lord, that you forgive us for these really shameful things. And Father, I do ask you now to bless the Word of God tonight, that insofar as it was true, I pray that you would apply it to our hearts and the mistakes that were made, I pray you would forgive. So hear our prayers now, Lord, for Christ's sake. Amen.